least once a week. <laughs> All right, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. We're moving toward the end. Acts chapter 28, looking once again at verses 1 through 6. Barbarian Hospitality and Barbecued Snake, Part 2. Acts chapter 28, and looking at the first six verses. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped to see, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Albeit, they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we look into this portion of Scripture, we thank you that your word is true and that it teaches us not merely interesting history, but it teaches us the basic principles of life. It teaches us the way we're to respond properly and how many times we respond improperly because we don't understand what's actually going on. Help us, Father, to learn to trust you and not to have the false gods of the world, for there are many, and we often fall into that trap even as Christians. Help us, Father, to understand what you are doing and what you are like as the true and living God. We have so many false concepts about you, so many things that we believe that are not really true, though it's quite popular in evangelical theology to believe some of them. And so, Father, we pray for the blessing that comes from you upon your word tonight, that it will go forth with clarity and power to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen. I recall about a year and a half ago, I showed a film on one of the Sunday evening specials about the lost shipwreck of the Apostle Paul. There's a boat that went down just before they got here to the island. And uh, there is a historic place, an historic place known as St. Paul's Bay, where everyone has assumed that that's where Paul was shipwrecked. And yet, a man who is a private investigator used to following clues said, you know, although that's the traditional popular place, it doesn't fit the text. And so he went and started looking, and he found four anchors in a different location that fits exactly what the text says. And that, I think, is a principle that we have to go forward with as we look at our study tonight, as Paul is being, now he's washed ashore, everybody has gotten there safely, God has fulfilled his word 100%. And so as we look at this tonight, we need to say, well, what does the text teach us what principles are we learning here that are important for us so that we'll know how to order our lives. I mean, you look at the barbarians and they obviously started with some wrong premises. When you start with wrong premises, you come to wrong conclusions. In fact, you may come to exact opposite conclusions from what the truth is. So you must always be sure that you have the right premises. They started with a premise sort of like we saw last week in Job, and I'm going to add some things to that tonight, that, oh, you know, he got snake bitten, so he must be a murderer. And then, when he doesn't die, they say, oh, he must be a god. They started with the wrong premise, and they came to two exact opposite conclusions with the wrong premise. So when we approach Scripture, the first thing we need to remember is that if you're approaching it with the wrong premises, you will come to the wrong conclusions. We need to make sure that all foundational premises as we approach the text are correct because people who approach the text with false premises are going to come to wrong conclusions and they end up in all the weird cults and all the weird theologies that you see even within the so-called Christian church. 
So last week we added to our study on how to apply the principles we learned from the shipwreck. In particular, we added some thoughts to the principle, your example and attitude will affect others around you. We need to start with some very important basic principles concerning that. God holds us accountable for the impact that we make on other people's lives. Unfortunately, we usually start with the premise that we are number one. You know, it's all about me. Some time ago, I gave a birthday card to someone, and uh, it said on the front of it, celebrate your birthday today because it's all about you. And be sure to have fun, and you open it up, and inside it says, because tomorrow it goes back to being all about me. <laughs> These folks here teach us something as we look at it, especially those who are exercising hospitality, and especially as we see the Apostle Paul with his attitude on board the ship, his example and attitude affected others. And God holds us accountable for the impact that we make on other people's lives. And unfortunately, we're often so selfish that we only think about ourselves. But God holds us accountable for the impact that we make on other people's lives. So how do you respond to people? When uh, people do you a nice favor, are you thankful? Or do you just sort of shrug it off and say, well, I, I deserved it? That's self-centered. When somebody does something that you think was bad and you think they hurt you, how do you respond? You gratefully say, thank you, Lord. You're teaching me not to be proud. Or do you explode? Our attitudes affect others. How we respond to life affects others. How we interact with people affects others. When they see our example, when they see us where we go and what we do, when they hear our words, we are making an impact on the lives of other people. Whether saved or lost, whether adults or children, we are making an impact on the lives of other people. And God will hold us accountable for that. Now, we learned at least three things that raised some very important questions for us last week. General lessons, generally applicable lessons, that tell us how God often works. First, God often takes away hope. He does this in our life, and he does that in the lives of those who are struggling against him to take away external hope so that there's nowhere else to turn except him. Second, take away human solutions. Because some people, as you know, and sometimes we do too, try every solution possible to the problem except God, and we don't give up until there are no other options. And then third, which is really the big point, and something we all have to learn, and I spent a great deal of time on this last week, God often brings the objects of his grace the objects of his grace to the breaking point. God may have to bring each of us to a final breaking point without killing us before we yield to his irresistible grace. God puts up with us because we're his chosen objects of grace. You often wonder why God puts up with you? I try to reflect this character quality in God because I know he has to had to put up with a lot with me and I say Lord teach me that character quality that quality of Christ to put up with those who are difficult to put up with because I was an object of your grace they are your children they should also be an object of my grace. Why? Because I must model Christ to them. That's a hard lesson to learn because we always like to think about ourselves first. We always want our own comfort. We always want our own stuff. We always want to be the one who's in charge, the one who's in control, the one who does it my way and not somebody else's way. God brings the object of his grace to the breaking point because we're chosen objects of grace. And sometimes horrible trouble is actually an act of God's grace to bring us to repentance. And we don't even know that we need to repent. We think we're okay. You know, that raised some big questions. First, we tried to answer the question that pagans frequently ask. Since the world is so bad, why hasn't God destroyed it already if he's a just God? 
And we saw that Peter answered that question over in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 1 through 18. And he points out that what he is teaching is not merely his own ideas, but he says that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. In other words, what Peter is teaching is something that was taught in the Old Testament by the prophets. And it is also something that was taught by the apostles of Jesus, which means they learned it from him. So when Peter addresses this question of how come God doesn't strike evil in the world, then Peter says, we have an answer. And it was taught before. If you hadn't been paying attention to the Old Testament prophets, if you haven't been paying attention to the Lord, if you haven't been paying attention to the apostles, let me state it for you again. And he says, don't you realize that it's going to get worse, not better? That the world is not going to repent. It's not going to all become you know, better and better and better and more glorious until we bring in the millennial reign of Christ, the amillennial position. That's foolishness. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He says, You know what? They know better, but they refuse to believe it. Because he says, For this they willingly are ignorant of. There's a difference between ignorance and willful ignorance. Willful ignorance is stubborn refusal to accept the truth. That's willful ignorance. That's what you have in the evolutionary world view all around us and which is promoted in all the big universities. And if you turn out to be a creationist, they cut you off, they fire you, they sever your tenure, they will not have anything to do with you because they do not want to believe. That's willful ignorance. And that's the specific point that he makes here, uh, the, the creation and also the, the great flood of Noah. They are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That's creation. Whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. That's Noah's flood. That's the willful ignorance that we see today. We talked about this morning how men have hardened their hearts to the truth and so God himself during the tribulation will send them strong delusion so that they will believe the lie who received not the love of the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a reason people reject the truth, folks. It's because they love their sin. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Jesus said so. It's willful ignorance. So Peter answers the question, how come God hasn't destroyed the world yet? Because he tells us the heavens and earth which are now by the same word are kept in store. God is holding it back temporarily. Reserved under fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. In other words, to you it's a long time, but to God it's not a long time. God is temporarily withholding his judgment. Why? Because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, that is, toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Yes, the elect need to come to repentance to be saved. But you and I need to come to repentance too for the sin that's in our lives. God hasn't sent his judgment yet. And then he goes on and describes all of the judgment and he talks about the inspiration of Paul's writings and so on. So remember the context here is judgment against sin. We also find the answer to the exact opposite question of why do the righteous suffer? In Peter the issue is why don't the wicked suffer? But that's the question, the opposite, with Job asks, when he as a righteous man is suffering, why is everything backwards? And so we covered some of that, but I want to at least cover the brief principles that I went over because there's material that we need to add to that so that if you're suffering, you will understand what God is doing in your life. Sometimes horrible trouble is actually an act of God's grace to bring us to repentance but sometimes it is an act of gives grace to cause us to grow in our knowledge of the person and ways of God. Not just to bring us to repentance, but it's also designed to cause us to grow. I made the point last week that we need to understand that suffering is not always because of personal sin. Not always. Now sometimes it is clearly because of sin, but sometimes it is not. 
Sometimes there's a direct correlation between sin and the chastening hand of God, because whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. But sometimes in the mysteries of the will of God, there is some suffering that relates to the unknown purposes, such as we looked at last week, the angelic war in heaven that we can't see. That's why we added some of those things last week. Somebody had asked a question about the book of Job. And we need to see that in the context of Paul and the shipwreck and the imprisonment and the almost drowning and the freezing cold and landing on a barbarian island and being bitten by a snake and having people misunderstand who he was. Paul, Paul went through it. I mean, we're talking about suffering here. I mean, we look at that and we say, Ooh, cool, he's, he's an apostle. Look at all the neat things he did. Folks, he was a human being too. If that happened to you, how would you like it to be 14 days on a boat where you couldn't eat anything because all you would do is upchuck? How would you like to be scared out of your wits that you're going to drown at any minute and get eaten by fish? How would you like to be without any hope and then have soldiers plotting to kill you so you won't escape? How would you like to fall onto a broken board and get washed in typhoon conditions up onto a beach where the people don't even speak your language? How would you like to get snake bitten? Paul was a real human being. When you read this, don't read it as though it were some kind of a novella. These are things that actually happen to a real man who is setting a real example for us. The sufferings of Paul, and we talked about how Job was this greatest man in the land of Uz. We talked about how he had seven sons and three daughters, all of whom got killed. To me, that's a, an incredible, painful thought. I mean, even to lose one son or one daughter is an incredibly painful thought. To lose all your children when you have that many. That's an incredibly painful thought. Job was a real man. Job actually went through this because something was going on in heaven that he didn't understand. So some suffering is because of personal sin, but some suffering is because God is refining us, he's teaching us, he's making us grow, he's bringing us into a deeper relationship with himself, he's causing us to understand his ways far beyond what we had ever imagined before, he's dragging us out of false theology and putting us into true theology. Those are different reasons that we see in the book of Job for the suffering that a believer goes through. Our responsibility is to respond properly and not improperly. And as we said last week, just like the storm and shipwreck in our text, there are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. Remember that. No accidents, only incidents. You serve a sovereign God. Not a sparrow falls without your father. No accidents, only incidents. When you face something horrible, remember that phrase, no accidents, only incidents. Let me say it together with you. No accidents, only incidents. Again, no accidents, only incidents. That'll bring you back and remember what we've talked about tonight and last week. When bad things happen, it's not always because of personal sin, though sometimes it is. Sometimes it's because God is stretching us. Sometimes it's a combination of both. Job actually had some sin that we find out about at the end of the book. He didn't know that it was sin. We'll talk about that tonight because that may be our problem too. But he immediately confessed it as soon as he understood it. God was doing two things in the life of Job. God always has a superintending purpose that will achieve without fail the divine goal even through our suffering. Let me say that again. God always has a superintending purpose that he will achieve without fail. He always reaches the divine goal. He never fails to reach the divine goal. And he will do it sometimes through our suffering. 
you know, don't get into the mindset that, especially when people accuse you, that personal sin is the reason that you are suffering and that you're personally involved in sin because that might not be the case. We will get spanked by God if we sin, but that's not the only reason we suffer. So don't let somebody put a false guilt trip on you if you suffer and you don't have current sin in your life like Job. If you've taken care of the sins the way you're supposed to, with confession and with repentance, then don't let somebody put a guilt trip on you. You have been forgiven. You may be restricted. God may open up different visas, vistas for you. But God makes no mistakes. Our responsibility is to learn the mind of God and move forward. The short-sighted notion that the only reason for suffering was current personal sin was the attitude of Job's three friends. You see, their whole approach throughout the book starts with that premise. They say many true things about God, but they fail to recognize that God is bigger and wiser than their limited view of a tiny little God that they can control. They simply don't know of all of God's reasons, and neither do I, and neither do you. Job himself not knowing until the end of the book is written that he was the subject of a discussion between God and the devil. How would you ever guess that? Would you ever guess that you are the subject of a discussion between God and the devil? That might actually have happened at some point. That may have been some reason that you went through something. Maybe you succeeded and won and maybe you failed and didn't win and so you're suffering as a result of that discussions between God and the devil you know that's foundational to the book of Job even though Job maintains his claim that his suffering is not the result of personal sin which is basically true but Job also begins with the same limited viewpoint on how God works and the question of suffering Job questions why you know we can't answer questions like why we can answer what but we don't always know the why. Why would God do these things to him? Because Job doesn't know of the specific sin in his life. He does have a little one. Oh, we think it's a little one. But he doesn't know it till the end of the book. He wants to talk to God about it. But even Job does not understand the big, bigger perspective. And that's why God speaks to him very roughly at the end of the book of Job. God's stretching Job's understanding and deepening Job's relationship with God, his creator. Did you know that when you respond properly to suffering, not improperly, you won't get the benefit of it. You'll just suffer. But when you s respond properly to suffering, it opens your understanding about God and it deepens your relationship with God. Do you respond properly to suffering? I mean, what kind of suffering are you going through? Some people have physical suffering. They really do. They go through horrible physical situations. Some people have emotional suffering. Some people have suffering that comes from the, the attacks of other people, the pressures of other people. Some people have suffering that relate to family problems. Some people have suffering that relate to horrible circumstances that happen in their lives, and, and they're trying to really try to serve God, but everything seems to be blockaded. The doors are all closed. The question is, how, how do you respond to suffering. We don't like to think about it because, you know, I suspect that most of us have the uncomfortable suspicion that if we really study this subject, if we really do, and if we really learn these principles, that somehow this sadistic God will, will bring suffering into our life and test us with suffering. And so we try to shove all that stuff away and just think the happy positive thoughts. We just don't like to think about it. We want to avoid suffering at all costs. Anybody can say amen to that? <laughs> you know it's true you say amen in your heart I really want to avoid suffering you do want to avoid suffering I want to avoid suffering it's natural to us we don't like to suffer it's like the old saying I hate the sight of blood especially my own <laughs> but it's a reality in our lives because God is conforming us to the image of Christ Job responds properly when he's challenged by God at the end of the book. What did Job do? It said, Job says, I repent myself. You say, but Job, all the way through the book, you, you upheld your righteousness. All the way through the book, 
you challenge those guys and say, point to one sin in my life. You can't find one thing that I've done wrong. And yet, after God speaks to Job, it says Job repents. What changed Job's attitude? What was it that God revealed to Job for which Job had to repent and admit his sinfulness? He repents for letting his self-righteousness cause him to question God. It's very important. You know when you question God, what you are doing is you are puffing yourself up with self-righteousness. And self-righteousness is sin. The only righteousness that is acceptable before God is the imputed righteousness of Christ. Isaiah says, and you've heard me preach this before, all our righteousnesses are as an unclean rag. That's a menstruous cloth. Self-righteousness stinks like a menstruous cloth. Job thought he was good. I mean, he prided himself on it. He did everything right. And so when suddenly he goes through suffering because he started with the wrong premise that the only reason for suffering is because of personal sin in your life right now. All his friends started with that premise. Job starts with that premise. And Job keeps defending his righteousness and they keep accusing him even though they don't know what the problem is. All the way through the book. And God finally says, Job, you know what you're talking about. Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? Where were you when I did this? Where were you when I did that? And Job begins to realize, you know, kind of stupid for a puny little creature like me to declare his own righteousness. God causes Job to grow. God opens Job's eyes. God begins to stretch Job. And Job responds properly. He repents. Job's a believer. He's an example for us. When we get all puffy and huffy about what other people have done to us, what we're saying is, I don't deserve this. Really? Do we understand the righteousness of God? The righteousness of Christ? Do we understand that there may not be any what we think of as big sins? Maybe only something little. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, but after all, how bad is that other person for doing this or that? And after all, how it affected me. Self-righteousness stinks in the eyes of God. Job, a righteous man with no known personal sin, finally repents because self-righteousness is sin. You see, Job was counting on his good works to keep everything smooth between him and God, which he equated with everything going smoothly in his temporal life. Let me say that again. Job was counting on his good works to keep everything smooth between him and God. But Job switched the focus of what was smooth between him and God because things were going smoothly between him and God. That's why God challenged the devil and said you can't find anything wrong with Job. But Job switched the focus to where instead of thinking in the spiritual realm, things smooth between him and God, Job focused on the temporal realm and thought, okay, if things are smooth between me and God, things will be smooth in the temporal realm. He wasn't equating good works with salvation. He wasn't equating good works with sanctification. But he was equating good works with guaranteed temporal happiness. That's false theology. That's the false prosperity theology of the charlatan charismatics that tell you that sending all your money to them will make you rich. Saying, well, if you're right with God, you get rich. And the way you get right with God is because you've heard me preach it, you send the money to me. Job was equating his good works with guaranteed temporal happiness. 
Job was doing everything that he was doing because he wanted temporal happiness. Folks, that's false theology. You still have to do everything right. You still have to be obedient. You still have to do what God wants you to do. But that does not guarantee temporal happiness. Temporal means things that take place in time and space right now before we go to heaven. Just because you do it right does not guarantee temporal happiness. Job's repentance from self-righteousness and from what might be called the forerunner of prosperity theology, his repentance put him back in a proper relationship with God. At that point, God got angry at Job's friends. And Job, God speaks to the oldest of them, Elihu. God gets angry at him and says, You've not spoken right about me like my servant Job. God got angry because they still, even after all of this, they hear God speaking to Job, even after all of this, they still don't get it, and so God's about to hit them as well. God demanded that they bring a burnt offering because they tried to put a guilt trip on Job without understanding the ways of God. And so God says, Ye have spoke, not spoken of me the thing which is right like my servant Job. Unquote. That's God speaking. Talking to the three friends. And then God tells Job to pray for his friends. Job does it. And they avoid God's wrath because Job prayed for them, not because they brought their sacrifices, though they had to do that, and they did it. Seven bullocks and seven rams. But that wasn't the reason. It was when Job prayed for them. Now, you know, um, in my carnality, after suffering that kind of verbal abuse from my friends, you know, I might want to have waited before I prayed for them. And just let them suffer a little bit like I have just suffered. But Job didn't wait to pray for his friends. He prayed immediately, and God accepted Job's prayer for them. Repentance and confession of sin always put you back in a right relationship with God. It also, and listen to this carefully, because this is what just happened here in Job, it also gives you a voice with God on behalf of others. If you're not in a right relationship with God, your prayers are going to fall flat. Not just your prayers for yourself, but your prayers for other people too. When you confess your sins, when you repent, it gives you a voice with God on behalf of others. That's a very important principle. You say, well, I'm, I'm really good because I don't just pray for myself, but I pray for everybody else, and I'm pretty proud of the fact that I don't just pray for myself. I, I pray for you know other people. Too. You know, you're getting into the problem that we see in the book of Job of self-righteousness. Self-righteousness is filthy sin. You know, as I look at the end of the book of Job, God blessed Job in the end more than he had in the beginning. <laughs> he didn't bless him with a new wife. He left her there as a reminder to Job not to have the wrong viewpoint again, not to get his theology scrambled with popular notions. But God blessed him with more children, seven more sons and three more daughters. God blessed him with wealth over his eyeballs. He had twice as much as he had before. God gave Job a huge long life, twice the normal life, 140 years so that he saw his descendants to the fourth generation, even though he had been sick with horrible diseases. Satan hit him with everything he could except killing him. That's what God said to Satan. You can do it. You can do anything you want to his body except you can't kill him. He not only recovered, he lived 140 years. It says here that Job's daughters were so beautiful <laughs> that they were more beautiful than any other daughters in the whole world at that point. You know, it's interesting that that kind of thing is mentioned because it's a very rare comment in the Bible to comment on physical beauty, especially in the context of it being good. I mean, you see Absalom, and we're told about his uh, physical prowess and handsomeness and all that, but he was a bad guy. But here, it tells us how beautiful Job's daughters were. They must have been incredibly beautiful uh, to have that kind of a comment. But now let me give a warning. Be very careful. 
I am not teaching, and the book of Job is not teaching, that if you follow this like a mechanical formula, you will get rich and have lots of kids and live a long life. That's not the point that Job is making, and that's not the point that I'm making. That's the kind of theology that got Job and his friends into trouble in the first place. You know, do everything right, follow the mechanical formula, and everything will be smooth in the temporal life. That's not true. Last week, I mentioned that the book of Job is important for us because James tells us so in the New Testament in James chapter 5. We talked about how many times uh, he speaks of the patience of Job and how many times the word patience is mentioned in five verses and endurance and suffering endurance and so on. Five times patience and waits endureth and suffering afflictions are also mentioned in the same passage. The difficult circumstances of life, that's patience. Long suffering is people. Patience is circumstances of life. Other principles that we added last week from the shipwreck. The passengers on the ship proved they believed the promises of God because they were willing to give up all their temporal goals of making money. And they were willing to give up all their personal possessions. They were willing to leave it all behind for the only important thing that mattered their lives. I want to add some stuff to that this week. It becomes clearer and clearer to me the longer I live that the things of earth slow you down. We talked about how God kills idol worshippers and covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is the idolater. It's in Colossians and Ephesians. God says it twice. Colossians 3 and Ephesians 5. Jesus talked about it in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 about when the trouble time comes, don't try to run back into the house and get your clothes. Head for the hills. Things of earth slow you down to the point where you may get killed as a result of them. You know, it's happened to many people. Their houses have been burning and they ran outside the house and they thought, oh, such and such is still inside the house. It doesn't look like it's too bad a fire yet. I'm going to run back inside and get it. And they ran back inside and the house collapsed and killed them. That has happened countless times in history and you've heard it on the news even here in the United States. Things of earth, even little things of earth, tie you down and it may end up with you dead. Remember that. There are a lot of illustrations of that in the Bible. You know, we talked about the one little thing that tempted Lot's wife and she turned into a pillar of salt. But did you know that Lot himself was guilty of the same thing? He just wanted one little thing. And that's what ended in the death of his wife because he didn't obey the initial command to go to the mountains. Listen. It ended in the death of his wife and ultimately incest with his daughters who produced two sons, Moab and Ammon, the ancestors of some of Israel's worst enemies. You know, Lot's wife turned to a pillar of salt after Lot asked his request to go to Zor instead. Listen to Genesis 19. And when the morning arose, then the angels hasten, hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, he couldn't leave it. Boy, God sure showed mercy to him. You know, man, all this stuff. I mean, Lot was a ruler in Sodom. He was a wealthy man. He had it all. He sat in the gate. That's the position of prominence and importance. Control. He overlooked the bad stuff that went on in Sodom because he had it all. It says, while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. They had four hands. There were four people. They grabbed one in each hand and they moved out. The Lord being merciful unto him. He didn't understand the mercy of God in the critical situation of life. Do you not understand the mercy of God in the critical situations of life? And they brought him forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, the angel said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. What was the command that, jo that the Lot was given as soon as they got outside the city? The angels could have dragged them to the mountains. They didn't. They got them out of the city. And then they told him what to do. He says, go to the mountain. Don't stay in the plain. Go to the mountain, lest I be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. 
You know, now Lot eventually ends up in the mountain. He should have gone there in the first place because look what happens after he makes his request. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy. <laughs> He's talking true theology here. Which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. But then the doubt. I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. Look, the angels just dragged you out of certain death. And now you're saying, I really don't want to go to the mountain because something bad might be in the mountains. I've heard about bad stuff in the mountains. I mean, you know, what kind of animals are in the mountains? You know, where is there going to be food in the mountains? What am I going to do if I go to the mountain? Some evil will overtake me and I die. Hey, fella, God just told you, move it. Get to the mountains. You know, fear, not faith, is what got him into trouble. You know, he looks at himself, he wasn't a Boy Scout, he was a city slicker. How can I go to the mountains? And so he says in verse 20, Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it's a little one. You know, folks, it's the little things in life that will kill you. It's the little things in life that God said no to that will kill you. It's a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. And then he says it again. Is it not a little one? God's making a point. Here's Lot begging with the angels. Let me go to Zohar. It's a little one. And then he says again. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. Angel responds to him. He said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, but I will not overthrow this city for which thou hast spoken. There were five cities of the plain. God overthrew four of them. He left one, which was a source of trouble later. God was going to judge all five because all five were involved in that wickedness. But Lot says, It's just a little thing. It's a little one. How many times have we approached God that way, at least in our attitudes, when there's some little sin in our life and we don't want to deal with it? Is it not a little one? Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities, and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. That's at the end. If he had fled to the mountains, that probably would not have happened. If he had fled to the mountains... God would have given him blessing. Instead, he decided he wanted to stay in another city of sin. Remember what happened to Achan and how others died because he coveted just a little thing. It's in Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. God had said, I want you not to take anything but to destroy it all. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, and saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up. And there was a little thing. This, this city is a, it's a Mickey Mouse city. We don't need to send the whole army there. Uh, you know, th this, this city can't possibly withstand us. Everybody looks at it and they say, yeah, it's a little deal. Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about three thousand men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about thirty and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. We start off with 36 people getting killed because one man has sinned, and we'll find out more about that in a moment. 
36 people, real living human beings, died because of one man. Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide he and the elders of Israel and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do to thy great name? Well, now there's the point that God intervenes. God didn't care about all the rest of that. You know, what's going to, be, what's going to happen to us? Oh, what's going to happen to our name? But then, what's going to happen to thy great name? It's at that point that God answers Joshua. You see, God doesn't care about your name or my name or how cool we are or how much, you know, suave we have. But he does care about his own name. If his name is going to be dragged through the mud, he cares about his name. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou upon thy face? Well, Lord, I thought that's what you want me to do. You know, when, when we have a problem, we, we come before you in prayer. We ask you to, to, to answer our problem because we got, we got you know, you, you told us to have prayer meeting. God says, hey, if you know what the problem is and you can do something about it, do something about it. Don't cry out to me when you have responsibility. That's a very important principle. We keep asking God to do stuff that he's told us to do. We can ask him for help in doing it. But if God tells you to do something, you have to do it. God makes it very clear in his word what things we are to do. The Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. In other words, they really hid it pretty good. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies. Because they were accursed, neither will I be with you any more, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. Now listen, this was a little thing. And what did God just threaten there? He said, I won't be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing because I told you to destroy everything. That's a pretty serious threat when God says, I'm going to quit helping you. How would you like him to say that to you? I'm going to quit helping you because you've got the accursed thing. Up, sanctify the people and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. One little thing can keep you from any success. Do you understand that? One little thing can ultimately block every blessing that God would otherwise have for you every spiritual victory, every forward accomplishment. In the morning, therefore, ye shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to their families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. Now, all through this process, Achan could have confessed. He was playing Russian roulette here, he was gambling the dice. I mean, remember, there are a minimum of 600,000 men, warriors. I think there were a lot more than that because I think there were 6 million Jews that came out of Egypt. But even the liberals admit that there are at least 600,000. So he's thinking, man, what are the chances, one in 600,000, that they'll land on me? Have you ever played the odds against God? Do you know that God always wins? and you never win? It's not one in 600,000. It's one chance in zero.
And he brought them man by man, and Achan the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was taken. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to God, the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. Now, he could have done that at any time along the road. But he waited until he was caught. You know, it's not like David. David, as soon as he was uncovered, repented and confessed his sin, but he still paid a price. The baby died. His sin with Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet says, Thou art the man. And David said, I have sinned. No big long process like we have here. David still got chastened. The baby died. His kingdom was divided. His son was in rebellion. He ended up losing four sons because he had pronounced a fourfold curse on the man who had taken the friend's sheep and killed it and eaten it. He lost four sons. Even though he instantly repented, Achan did not. But because David did, God said, Thou shalt not die. But Achan did. Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, two hundred shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of fifty shekels weight, then I coveted them, and I took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it. Now, how would you like to die for one set of clothes, a really fancy dress or a nice suit? And um, 50 silver dollars, or 200 silver dollars, and a big gold coin. How would you like to die for that? You know, I think if Aiken had thought about it in advance and known the conclusion, he would have said, whoa, you know, that's really nice. I would really like that, that suit. That is so cool. I will look so cool in front of my friends. They will say, man, Aiken, where'd you get that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty conservative with my money. And, uh, uh, you know, well, we were trading with these guys. Right. He died for a fancy outfit, 50 silver bucks, and a chunk of gold. Just a little thing. So Joshua sent. Well, we'll confirm it. You know, a lot of people confess uh, when they're in a tough situation, even when they didn't do a crime. You know, people who are like that. I know some people who have confessed the things they didn't do simply because they just want to get out of the police station. Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in the tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought them unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that they had. And they brought them into the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? Remember, 36 men just died because this guy wanted a new suit. Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burnt them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Wherefore the name of that place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. <coughs> Do you get the principle? This ties in very closely with what we've got going tonight. When there's sin in the camp, the whole camp suffers. When there's sin in the church, the whole church suffers. And the people who cover the sin die along with the sinner. Did you get that? His family obviously knew about it. It was in the middle of his tent. He hadn't gone out and found a tree someplace and dug and hut it and never told his wife and never told his kids. It was in the middle of his tent under a rug. When he set up the tent, do you think the family was there? When he dug the hole, do you think the family was there? When he put it back over, he says, shh, don't tell anybody about this. Do you think the family heard him? 
But remember the balancing principle that we've just studied. Not all suffering is a result of personal sin. However, personal sin can result in being the sin unto death. And we've talked about that a good deal before. You know, that same incident is mentioned again in Joshua as a warning to the people in chapter 22, all the way down 15 chapters later. Did not Achan the son of Zerah commit a trespass in the accursed thing, and wrath fell on all the congregation of Israel, and that man perished not alone in his iniquity? Achan's kids and his wife died with him because they knew the spoil was there and they hid it. It's the little sins that kill you. It's the little stuff that you overlook every day. Or as Solomon put it, it's the little foxes. They're the ones that spoil the vine. Song of Solomon 2.15, Take us the foxes, the little foxes, that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The Bible guarantees that your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, 23. But if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. It's a fascinating word that's used here, the word that's translated find you out. That's a word that is used to describe a vicious wild animal that stalks its prey until suddenly it strikes and rips the terrified prey to shreds. Your sin will be like a wild animal that stalks you and stalks you until suddenly it attacks you and rips you to shreds as you scream in terror. Notice, people m misread this verse. They say, well, somebody will find out about your sin. That's not what it says. It does not say someone will find out about your sin, although that often happens. It says that your sin, like a wild animal that stalks you until it kills you. I can't believe our time is up. I'm giving you foundation, background. Why do the things happen to the Apostle Paul? And why could Paul be absolutely calm about it and not question God? Because he had the perspective that Job and his three friends didn't have starting out in the book, but what Job comes to and which we are supposed to come to when we reach the end of the book. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again we thank you for the time you've given us tonight to study very important principles and how you deal with us and how we should respond properly when times of difficulty and suffering come and how you use it to expand us and cause us to grow and draw us closer to yourself and give us more than we could ever ask for. All that we could hope or think is way smaller than what you have in store for us and the blessings that you guarantee and the eternal rewards when we are so focused on temporal things. Help us to remember it's the little things that kill us. It's the little things that gnaw away at us, the things that we overlook day by day. The things that tend to be in our lives and we don't care. Job just had a little thing. He had self-righteousness. But because of it, at the end of the book, God had to speak harshly to Job and Job responded properly. He repented. And he not only got back in fellowship for himself, but then he was a means of praying for others. God heard his prayer when he was in fellowship with God. And Father, sometimes we wonder why you don't hear our prayers because they're focused on ourselves. They're focused on temporal things. They're focused on the things of earth. And we're really not in fellowship with you. We just want. And you say no to us. Father, help us to learn so that when we face the kinds of things that the Apostle Paul went through, even such horrible things as being driven around on a boat that's going to wreck and then almost drowning and then being washed up on shore and being bitten by a snake and having people think all kinds of stupid things about him. Being incarcerated and wrongly so. Yet he never lost faith in you. He went through it because he knew that you were in control and that there are no accidents in the plan of God, only incidents. Help us to learn that as well so that we might serve you more faithfully. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight is number 344, much in line with what we've just studied. Grace greater than our sin. Number 344. The grace of God is what sometimes brings us through the points of suffering because